right, excuse me, everybody. If you'd like to take a seat, we'll get started shortly. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan Lovell. I'm the Director of Research here at George, George Whitfield College. Uh, and I, um, I head up the Evangelical Research Fellowship. Uh, and it's my joy to welcome you to this jointly hosted lecture between the Evangelical Research Fellowship and the Bible Institute at Cork Bay. Uh, a special welcome also to those who are joining us online. Uh, we're also grateful you will have noticed to have CBD here at the back uh, with many of Craig's books and others, and they've asked me to let you know that it's 10% off. Uh, and if you'd like to browse later, then that will be fine. They'll stick around afterwards, I'm sure. Uh, it's my great joy, though, this afternoon to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Craig Blomberg. Uh, Dr. Blomberg is the Distinguished Professor Emeritus of the New Testament at Denver Seminary in Colorado in the United States, where he's been teaching since 1986. His areas of academic expertise include study on the Gospels, the parables, the historical Jesus, and the trustworthiness of Holy Scripture, as well as many other works in New Testament more broadly. Uh, he's the author of over 30 books. I don't know how you get time to do that. Um, not all of which are at the back, but some of which are at the back. Uh, pitched at both academic and pastoral levels. Uh, many of us will have come across his works, uh, for example, Neither Poverty Nor Riches. Uh, I read back when I was in college in the NSBT series. I think that is there. Uh, and I remember also um, uh, Contagious... Was it Contagious Riches? That one. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's Contagious Holiness. That one is also there. Um, I remember that one too. <laughs> I don't remember the name of it, apparently. <laughs> um, Dr. Blomberg has also served on the committee uh, on Bible translation for the NIV version of the Bible. So if you have any quibbles with that translation, this will be a good chance to um, take it up with one of the translators. Uh, over the course of his career, Dr. Blomberg has been invited to teach all over the world on six continents if the internet is to be believed. Uh, but... This afternoon, we welcome him to Cape Town. Uh, it's been our pleasure uh, this week for him to teach in our postgraduate module here in New Testament on Matthew's Gospel. We're very glad to have him with us. It's been a joy to have him around. Uh, this afternoon's lecture will be titled The Historical Reliability of the Gospels, My Latest Thinking on the Topic That Won't Go Away. Now, before I pray and invite Dr. Blomberg up onto the stage, let me also introduce you to my co-host for this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Pete Smuts is the Dean of Graduate Studies at the Bible Institute at Cork Bay. I believe that's, is that the correct title? Uh, acting, I'm sorry, <laughs> Acting Principal at the Bible Institute at Cork Bay. Uh, there'll be a time for questions after the talk. Uh, which Pete will be moderating, uh, so I encourage you to make mental notes as we go along and you can ask your questions. Uh, so let me pray and let me hand over to Craig. Gracious Father, uh, by your Holy Spirit you have inspired all of Scripture for our good and for our learning uh, so that we might know you better and so that you might teach us about your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for giving us a trustworthy witness to the things that you've done in history. And as we think further about that this afternoon, again, by your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would sharpen our minds and guide our thoughts. Help us, Father, to know you better, to worship you truly, and to serve your people well. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Please would you join me in welcoming Dr. Blomberg. Thank you, Nathan. Good to see everybody. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, at least 10 of those books were 
with someone else, so that's part of the answer to your question. Um, and no, I don't think this is quite the same shirt that is in that picture, but it's <laughs> strikingly similar. <laughs> You should have a handout near you, uh, preferably that you can see. Follow along if you're interested. Um, most people who do a doctorate in one of the theological disciplines, if they publish, publish first um, a slightly revised version of that dissertation. But um, through circumstances that I had nothing to do with creating, um, way back in the 1985-86 academic year, I was invited by the universities and colleges Christian Fellowship in the UK to uh, spend nine months at Tyndale House in Cambridge and work on a book that was not so creatively entitled The Historical Reliability of the Gospels, um, as the outgrowth of a six-volume collection of fairly technical essays um, called uh, Gospel Perspectives. Um, it's amazing to go back and, and look at it today. It was using state-of-the-art technology called Camera Ready Copy. You typed on an electric typewriter. You tried to make as few mistakes as possible. You used white out very carefully if you had to correct anything. And then the book came out looking exactly like you had typed it. So long ago. <laughs> From there, I moved to Denver, where we've been for, uh, what does that add up to, going on 38 years, but um, began to be a little frustrated by the culture in the um, late 80s and early 90s, at least in the States. I met um, representatives and leaders from many of the parachurch organizations. Um, wouldn't you be interested in having me come and talk on this topic? And the leaders all said, I would love to hear you, but our students aren't interested. They just want to find out how they can make the most money and um, have good, successful careers and learn about the how-to issues in the Christian life. I thought, hmm, how much has changed since the 70s when I was in college? But then came the Jesus Seminar in the mid-90s. And then, in what I'm sure he never intended, Dan Brown gave an enormous impetus to those of us who were doing things on the reliability of the Bible by writing the Da Vinci Code, which meant that everybody invited us to talk about, is that true? No, it wasn't. And then came other things that by this time uh, took an internet world by storm, such as uh, the Gospel of Judas, Jesus' family tomb. Anybody remember these? things. And then somewhere in the 2010s and up to the present, the never-ending succession of blogs and vlogs and podcasts and videos and every medium available with the so-called aggressive atheists, some of whom seriously question whether Jesus ever existed. It's, it's sad from a perspective of, of furthering the Christian gospel, but it does at least mean that this is still the topic I get invited to speak on more than any other single one that I've worked on, and I am somewhat glad for that because I think it is an important topic. What you have in front of you is a document that I have long since lost track of how many different editions it has gone through. Um, I do know that the first time I, I gave a talk on this, uh, not long after the Jesus Seminar started making waves, was at a small Christian church up in the mountains of Utah in heavily Mormon country. There might have been 50 people that packed out the crowded little 
um, auditorium that we had. And, um, well, there were originally 10 points. Now there are 12. And um, the wording has varied. And the subpoints have changed many times over. But it still is the framework that, going on 30 years later, I use and update. The bibliography, except for one of my books, is totally different. <laughs> And it struck me that um, I tend to use this for churches. I tend to use it for the parachurch world. Um, what would I say if I were to tweak this, if I were to revise it, if I were to update it for a combined audience from a couple of colleges, uh, Bible institutes, and um, out came not this calf, but this handout. We have probably less than 40 minutes. Um, divide that by 12. That's an average of, what, three and a fraction. I'm deliberately going to take longer on the first few points, so relax. I do tend to watch my watch. And then I will start to pick up the pace, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Maybe it's uh, also the influence of Tyndale House because uh, since Peter Williams has become the principal there, there's been quite a focus on New Testament textual criticism. But uh, this is an area where um, Christians often tend to rely on works that are, how shall we say it nicely, out of date. Um, the single most reprinted work on uh, the textual criticism of the New Testament is F.F. F. Bruce's little book that was last revised in the 60s. A lot has happened since then. But there is also a tendency to unnecessarily inflate numbers. On this handout, I put over 5,400 ancient Greek manuscripts. You can find books that will say 56, 57, almost 6,000. And Peter Gurry and Elijah Hickson, whose work appears in the short bibliography at the end of the handout, um, at Tyndale House did a wonderful work on the myths and mistakes of New Testament textual criticism. One of the things that is very difficult for, for many of the ancient manuscripts when they are in such fragmentary form is to determine are they all from different manuscripts or where the orthography looks quite similar are a whole number of fragments from the same manuscript. And therefore it's possible that the number is as low as 5,400, but that's still very high. Craig Evans, in another book on the bibliography, has stressed, based on some studies that have been done looking at ancient libraries, ancient book and scroll use, that the impression that Christians and skeptics alike often have of books being fragile, scrolls getting torn, um, parchment being thrown out, redone, really doesn't fit the evidence that we have where books from libraries that actually circulated a fair amount on average lasted 150 years before they had to be re-inked, which was preferable to discarding them. Now that's an average, and you can find numbers all over the map on either side of it. But um, the idea that because all of our fragments are second century, and those tend to be quite fragmentary, and it's not until the early third century that you tend to get an entire book or an entire gospel, certainly not until the fourth century before you get an entire New Testament. 
that there must have been, as Bart Ehrman likes to say, copies of copies of copies of copies of copies until he falls off his platform. We might be, if we're in Dublin, at the Chester Beatty Library at Trinity College, a lot of material from about 200 AD. Given the fact that it made it as far as Ireland, uh, we probably don't have any copies of originals. We certainly don't have any originals. It's not impossible that we have a copy of a copy of an original. And it's probably pretty likely that we have a copy of a copy of a copy of an original. And when we see how much care people took on average, um, this is really quite inspiring. Um, I love what Dan Wallace at, at Dallas likes to do. They tend to use the UBS Greek New Testament, which is what I brought with me. And with a little bit of exaggeration, but to make the point, he will say, you've, you've heard it said that we don't have any of the originals. I'm here to tell you we do. We have the originals right here. It's just that we're not always sure if it's in the text or in the footnotes. <laughs> and until you can learn to read the chicken tracks that masquerade as footnotes, that, that can be a bit daunting. But it's certainly important, I think, to tell any audience at any level that no doctrine or practice of Christianity depends solely on a disputed text and that the percentage, as Wallace says, that is both significantly in question and significant. It matters. It's more than a spelling variation or the position of words or the use of an article or non-article or, or preposition that in a given context makes very little difference. It's probably less than 1%, which by standards of what we have from any other kind of document from antiquity is extraordinary and should be encouraging. The next two points we can really take together, and these tend to be the points that the popular level apologist will often stress. Um, I get, as maybe those of you who are lecturers do as well, a lot of unsolicited email asking me questions about some things that I'm qualified to talk about. It's amazing what people think a professor in a given discipline knows. But then my younger daughter is a, is a biochemist and uh, she understands that people say, so you're a scientist, what do you think about... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not a zoologist, and I'm not a botanist, and um, how much is at stake with authorship and dating? I happen to think a good case can be made for the four traditional authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm often astonished, maybe is a slight overstatement, that People just recycle the arguments of a generation ago without even interacting with or acknowledging that they know of extensive evangelical responses to those arguments. But as Don Carson, who I take it is a friend of this college and not known for his liberal leaning tendencies, um, says in his commentary on Matthew, at the end of the day, any date between 40 and 100 is possible. Oh, that's a depressing thought. Except to say, it's first century. And yes, I think a good case can be made for traditional authorship, but if it's wrong, all we've done is probably removed the actual author by one person further removed from the original events. Probably a disciple or follower of one of the men named Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, uh, which then is why the work was attributed. 
to them. When we still compare with my favorite example is Alexander the Great. Plutarch, late first, early second century, um, probably the best and most reliable biographer that we have. Other sources now lost um, from a slightly earlier time, writing about a man who died in 323 BC. And um, generally, major contours of his biography make its way into world civilization's textbooks. The time period, the distance from whoever the writers were to the original material is so much shorter that we have good reason to um, be confident, be optimistic about what we find. Number four is one that goes through interesting mutations. There was a time when um, if something was theological, how could it be historical? I, I remember in college, in uh, liberal Lutheran context in the States, losing count of the number of times one of my professors would say, well, no, we're not sure this is historical because it's theological. And I remember discovering a, a quite new book by a, a young Scotsman I had never heard of, I, Howard Marshall. I thought, that's a funny way to say your name. Oh, I see, I is an abbreviation for Ian. Um, Luke, historian and a theologian, published in 1970, and I devoured it because here was a scholar saying something could be both at the same time. Today, you don't hear that uh, question nearly as much, but you still hear people saying, didn't the first Christians believe the end of the world was going to happen in their lifetime, in their generation? A series of passages that I think are wrongly interpreted if they're taken to mean that, although you can understand why some might have taken them to mean that. I think we need to distinguish between imminence and immediacy when it comes to statements that Jesus and others made about uh, the parousia, about his return. Um, but then we also need to remember that there was a monastic community in the wilderness at a place called Qumran, who apparently were Essenes. And James Vanderkam has a wonderful several hundred page history of the movement at Qumran, probably starting around 200 BC, maybe not quite that old, dying out largely at the same time as the Roman War, the events leading up to 70 AD. And Qumran didn't even leave behind a single historical narrative about their own community. They wrote other kinds of genres of writings, but from them you can piece together and create a bit of a history of the community, the founding teacher of righteousness, developments theologically along the way. They were quite convinced they were living in the last days for about 250 years. Much like from Isaiah, oh sorry, Isaiah's day on, 8th century BC, the writing prophets of the Hebrew scriptures kept saying the day of the Lord is at hand, the day of the Lord is at, how big is your hand? <laughs> Richard Bauckham, back in 1980, wrote a book called, the, uh, 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 an article in the Tyndale Bulletin called the, the Delay of the Parousia. And he points out that the very psalm that 2 Peter 3 refers to, Psalm 90, verse 4, and then 
elaborates a little bit, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, was actually the text that you can find in numerous Second Temple Jewish writers as sort of the standard go-to text to explain how this might be the final generation. But let's not count on it. <laughs> it's been going on several centuries now that way. Points five and six can also, to some degree, be taken together. Among them, there are three main models that have all vied for um, pride of place, and I don't think they need to be pit against each other. Berger Gerhardson, back in the 1960s, became famous for his works on Hebrew memorization. And those shouldn't be neglected. If you want the update, Craig Keener's book in the little bibliography called Christobiography is just a treasure trove of all kinds of arguments for uh, the reliability of uh, the Jesus narratives in the Gospels. And the feats of memorization in an oral culture that we can document in Jewish and Greek and Roman circles boggle your mind. Until I think back to when my girls were teenagers. <laughs> there were three delightful CDs. Remember CDs? That um, I think we heard almost daily for several years before we became empty nesters. There was uh, Man of La Mancha, there was Les Mis, and there was Phantom of the Opera, and then for comic relief, there was the complete works of Veggie Tales. Um, and I have confirmed repeatedly so that I don't bear false witness that there was a time when both daughters had the music and libretto to all four of those collected works flawlessly memorized. And not once did they ever sit down and study a written text. I love some of that music. It was several years after they left before I could bring it out of hiding and listen to it again. <laughs> you just tire of it at some point. But ancient Hebrews chanted and put rhythm or meter and learned scripture as the resource that had answers to literally every question in life. If you're creative enough, you can find an answer there. To be able to learn the amount of information that's in the longest of the four gospels in terms of number of words, the gospel of Luke, less than 20,000. There's more than 100,000 words in both the Iliad and the Odyssey that many Greek schoolboys memorized. There's more than 600,000 words in the Hebrew scriptures that some rabbis had mastered quite a bit of and occasionally memorized the whole thing as a handful of rabbis in contemporary Israel have to this day. Sometimes people like to say, well, wasn't the oral tradition um, like the child's game of telephone? No, it wasn't. It might have been child's play, but simply because memorizing that would not have been that hard by the standards of the day. But then it's important to acknowledge that much more than that had to have been going on or we would have had four identical Gospels, at which point we would have needed only one. What Ken Bailey, what Jimmy Dunn, what some others have sometimes called um, informal controlled oral tradition or flexible transmission within fixed limits may be a more helpful model at some points. 
Before he passed away, the last 20 years or so of his academic career, Jimmy Dunn was a uh, former uh, Lightfoot professor at the University of Durham in England, was lobbying for is, no, let's not throw out Mark and Priority. Mark probably was written first, and Matthew and Luke probably knew him and relied on him at places for exact wording. Maybe not even entirely throw out the Q hypothesis. There are some reasons why it makes sense in places, but let's make the default model one of oral tradition. Let's make written literary dependence secondary rather than the other way around. Before a text was formally canonized, deemed authoritative by a community of people, before an epic saga became fixed in a local traditional village in a semi-literate context. There was great freedom among storytellers, but they were authorized storytellers, not just anybody in the community could do it. There was a great freedom to leave out, put back in, explain, abbreviate, elaborate, highlight what seemed to be the pieces of the tradition that were most relevant for a given setting in which the story was being retold, but there were always fixed points that had to be unaltered if you were going to be faithful to the message. And the audience... The local community had both the right and the responsibility to interrupt and correct if people missed out or misconstrued those fixed points. And then the, the most recent trend that I find just fascinating to study, Richard Bauckham has written some of, of this in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, is what's called social memory. And that can cut two ways. I can manipulate an audience. A group of leaders can manipulate uh, a particular congregation if they tell what some people know is not quite accurate often enough that the majority begin to believe it is accurate. It happens every day on the internet. It's why we have the expression fake news. It's why pastors around the world are saying, I'm so tired of hearing the latest conspiracy theory from people in my congregation who get all their news from one very narrow tradition and sources and won't fact check it and won't apply what biblical scholars call the criterion of multiple attestation from independent witnesses. My wife, who's a New Yorker, so that explains it, um, likes to tell people that she checks Fox News and CBS and BBC and Reuters and Al Jazeera. And you know, if you find something that's on all those sources, it probably happened. That's a pretty good fact-checking approach. It's not that everything that happened will be on one of those, but you understand the spins that each puts on it. Let's use the web intelligently. But social memory can also cut in another direction, and that is that if responsible leadership refers to the history of a community, to the establishment of a church, to the inspiring founding principles of George Whitfield College and the Bible Institute of South Africa. Does it not to bore people, but often enough that even as students or parishioners come and go, you can't help but hear the story? Then that sticks and it has influence and people start to quote it, and you can have somebody start to miss a certain part of it, and their friend will say, no, 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 be sure to say this. Maybe the most underutilized 
fact, observation of the Gospels is the sending out of the 12 and the sending out of the 70. Matthew says, Jesus sent out the 12 to all of the towns and villages in Galilee. Josephus says that was about 200. If he's right. Well, he is known to exaggerate figures, so let's say there were 50. And not to mention all the times the disciples were traveling with Jesus. Besides that, how many times did they hear the teachings that were in the Sermon on the Mount? Or the Sermon on the Plain? Or parables that in one gospel are linked together and another one are broken up and put in different places? How many times before Jesus even died and rose again had the disciples themselves orally, probably in somewhat fixed form, committed to memory, but with some flexibility in storytelling, shared these texts? People turn to the Gospel of John and say, nobody could have memorized something as long as chapter 8. What's it have? 58 verses? Most of it's one sermon? Not quite. Starts in verse 13. They couldn't. Even though some rabbis did allow for note-taking. Even if it probably wasn't quite like Matthew and the Chosen, somewhere on the spectrum. <laughs> Little ADD, I love it, wiggle in his head all the time. <laughs> How could they not have had large amounts without trying, committed to memory, just because they heard it so often, but maybe not exactly verbatim in every detail in each occasion? We need to change some default models. Luke 1, 1 to 4, you know the preface of Luke, stands out, very distinctive in style, in register, in uh, lack of the Hebraisms that you get in the rest of Luke 1 to 2. And it does what you expect a prologue in a historical or biographical document to say. So often people say, well, how do we know that these weren't works of historical fiction? As far as I can tell, it's because nobody had yet invented that genre and wouldn't for another 1,700 years. Oh, it's not that people didn't write fiction in the form of narrative in the ancient world, but they tipped their hand that they were doing so. How do you know that Judith and Tobit, my two favorite books in the Old Testament Apocrypha, if you've never read Judith, I mean, that's just delightful. She is such a heroine and so Jewish. Because there are gross anachronisms. Nebuchadnezzar fighting Jews in the second century BC, no, no. That's not somebody's gross error. That's the way you tipped off your hand that this wasn't sober history writing. And you certainly didn't begin with a preface like you find in Luke's gospel. Numbers eight and nine, the hard sayings, the missing topics. Don't hear too much about those um, as I once did. But the, the implication there is uh, if the gospel writers felt free to play fast and loose with history, as so many of the more radical critics claim, then why did they leave some of the troubling stuff in that they did? Hate your father and mother? You're not worthy to be my disciple? How many have obeyed? No, no, don't, don't answer. Not even the Son of Man knows the day or the hour of his return. 
Well, I can explain that theologically. Jesus in the incarnation did not lay aside his divinity, but he laid aside the independent exercise of his divine prerogatives, except when it was his father's will. That's great for a theology textbook. Would you ever come up with that just reading the Gospels by itself without Philippians 2 and a few other things? <laughs> Why not just leave out the stuff that caused people to have to make up a formulation like that? And then what about the stuff that's not there? I I'm quite sure there's nobody in this room of how many genders do you have here? Um, <laughs> we're multiplying them ad nauseum back home. Has ever, of whatever gender, put circumcision as one of your top 50 moral questions that kept you awake at night? But if you were a first century Greek, increasingly convinced by the gospel, wanting to dedicate your life to Jesus, <laughs> and you were male, and there were these groups of people dogging Paul's footsteps, he called them Judaizers, who said, we love Jesus the Messiah, and oh, by the way, you also have to keep the law, and Joe, <laughs> now, that was a Hebrew name, Alexander, you need to be circumcised. Well, you can see why there were people called God-fearers, <laughs> kept all the laws but that one. Why not solve the problem by quoting Jesus? It would be pretty authoritative. <laughs> Paul does that in 1 Corinthians on divorce and remarriage. He does it on uh, accepting money for ministry. He does it on questions about the return of Jesus. Why not on this one? Apparently, Jesus never spoke on the topic that anybody knew of, and no one felt free to make something up. Other examples could be given. The testimony of non-Christian writers, point 10, you can see the names there. The composite of all of those writers allows us to say that Jesus most certainly lived, was a first third of the first century Jewish man, who was born out of wedlock. If you don't believe the virginal conception story, there's some creative alternatives. Who gathered disciples, five of them are named, a couple of the names are garbled, but we think we can figure out which one it was supposed to be. Whose ministry intersected with that of a man named John who baptized people for the repentance of sin and later was executed by Herod Antipas for calling out the palace for their adultery and incestuous remarriage. That he had a brother named James, who later was martyred also. That his interpretations of the Jewish law regularly fell afoul of the authorities. And eventually that led to his arrest. Even though he had worked what Josephus called paradoxon. Paradoxes, wonders, mighty, wondrous deeds. People didn't know quite what to make of them. Even though people had thought he was the Jewish Messiah. He was arrested, crucified under Pontius Pilate. And yet... The tribe of his followers exists to this day, Pliny says at the end of the first century, and they meet weekly singing hymns to him as if he were a god. That's a pretty reasonable amount of information to confirm that the guy lived. Why not more? It, it seems so little compared to what's in all four gospels. Nobody yet knew that the movement that would grow would become what it did. I, I love, hate, 
love-hate relationship with some of these websites that say 20 historians of the time or shortly after Jesus who never spoke of him. How can that be? And then I go down the list and one is Strabo, a geographer, and another one is a botanist. And there's Philo, the philosopher who lived in Egypt, died in 50, had the gospel made it there yet in any significant way? And then there are mostly Greek and Roman writers whose purview never brought them within hundreds of kilometers of Israel, which was that outpost. Pilate was not honored by being assigned there, whatever sent him to Israel. And what did ancient historians write about those that were bona fide historians? You wrote about the exploits of kings and queens and military generals and their commanders and their battalions and the wealthy and people in officially sanctioned positions of religious or philosophical influence. Jesus and his band of followers doesn't qualify on any of those counts. Why would you expect more? The fact that we have what we have is about what we should have expected. Archaeology has confirmed even more. Keeps on going. One of the things now that people just keep finding are mikvaot, ritual immersion pools. If you had a decent amount of money in a decent sized home, you probably had your own private mikvah. That was such a, a dominant part of the culture. And stone jars everywhere around these mikvaot. Yeah, they, they were heavier, they cost a little bit more, but they kept the water pure, it didn't leak. John 2, 6, the turning of water into wine at Cana. And John writes, now there were standing there six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification. <laughs> Who cares what the jars were for? This is a miracle. This is about wine. <laughs> you should know something about that in South Africa, especially here. Huh. Maybe that's a tip off to the prevalence of things that we keep discovering years and years later and testimony of other early Christian writers. All of the allusions to Jesus' sayings in the writings of Paul, probably some in James, maybe one or two in 1 Peter. The high, lofty Christology found in the early creeds or confessions that predate even the oldest epistles, like Philippians 2 like Colossians 1, like the list of resurrection witnesses in, in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to leave time for you to ask questions, but if this were an evangelistic outreach, I would end by saying, you know, there are three ways to do a long jump. <laughs> You've only seen one in the Olympics. You could theoretically send people down a track and before they fall and get to the line, they have to, um, like some of those cartoon characters of old, screech to a stop, fling themselves up into the air and see how far backwards they can jump and put every bone in their body out of joint. Uh, there's good reason we don't do that, but there are folks who say Christian faith is in spite of the evidence, and that would be an analogy for them. There are others, some of them are in our churches, who say, here's the world of faith, here's the world of history, never the two shall meet, I never liked history anyway, just believe 
God said it, I believe it, that settles it. For me, I'm glad it does, but it doesn't settle it for the person who doesn't believe. And then how do we have a conversation? That would be like uh, what we can do in the Denver Zoo with little kids where there's a place where they go up to a line and they see painted on a mural how far different animals can jump. And then their goal is to, from a standing start, jump and see what animal they are. Sorry. I get carried away. <laughs> or it's like a proper long jump. The historical evidence can't prove everything. You can't prove inerrancy empirically. There's an element that has to be taken on faith. Historians are trustworthy where they can be trusted. At some point, you give them the benefit of the doubt where they can't be tested. But the momentum, oh, there might be a wind on a certain day. There might be a headwind. There are those few seemingly intractable problems pushing back. But for the most part, you're building up a head of steam and you jump and you just see how far you get. But you probably at least land in the sand. <laughs> I think that's the, the better analogy to the relationship between discussing historical reliability and the reality of Christian faith. Some people prefer to say, no, it's not a leap of faith. It's just a step. Well, maybe it's a big step. Be of good cheer. There is still good evidence. 1987 subtracted from 2024, 37 years later, <laughs> for the historical reliability of the Gospels. You wouldn't know it if all you did was surf the web. But you wouldn't know anything non exciting if all you did was surf the web. You wouldn't know the evangelistic successes worldwide. <laughs> I hope you have some other sources of news as well, even beyond my wife's five. Maybe those are the big five. You talk about the big five, South Africa, <laughs> animals. But um, let's have some questions. Uh, Peter, come up and do your thing. And I'm going to sit down for a moment. Can you hear me? Good. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Dr. Blomberg. I'd also like to just use this, this opportunity to uh, thank George Whitfield College for asking us to co-host uh, today's event. I've been asked to facilitate the Q&A. Just to be clear, <laughs> uh, Dr. Blomberg is answering the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what we agreed on? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, now, apparently, this is being live streamed, so there is going to be a roving microphone. Is that correct? There we go, Sarah. So, if you'd like to ask a question, just put your hand up, and we'll pass the mic to you. And if you can speak right into the mic, so that uh, our viewers can uh, hear the the question. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Blomberg. Um, I have always been impressed by Richard Borkham's argument in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, yeah. um, particularly his argument that you know, in, ancient histori in ancient historiography you had named eyewitnesses were often sort of the first person named, the last person named in a narrative, and he sort of points that out in John's Gospel, in Mark, Peter being sort of the named eyewitness behind the narrative. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Um, has there been recent work in that area, so sort of building on um, Richard Borkham's work? Certainly we have reason to believe from ancient church testimony, uh, long before Richard Borkham, uh, that uh, believed that Mark got much of his information from Peter. So something like that, I think, is, is built very solidly. Um, Names at, at the beginning and ends of narratives is suggestive. I don't know how probative it is. Um, one of the places where Richard has taken a bit of criticism is 
What about the unnamed people? Was that to protect them? In case Rome should find out, well, there are plenty of people who are named. <laughs> um, there are some places where others, including other evangelicals, would say maybe he's pushed things a bit too far. But when he's dealing with these three main models of memorization, of flexible tradition, of social memory, I, I think he's, he's spot on. And I think we can, we can push some of those arguments even further. Thank you very much, Dr. Blomberg. Um, yeah, so, so my question is, how do we reconcile the differences between what we see in John's Gospel and the Synoptics? Because there are those who would write off John's Gospel as not having historical credibility because of the differences with the Synoptics. For various reasons, they might identify the geographical narrative differences, the way in which they might say that it's the spiritual Gospel um, you've got the time difference as well. There are other reasons as well. So how would you reconcile the differences between John's Gospel and the synoptics? Well, I might um, defer the question to a couple of things I've written. Um, more than 20 years ago now, a, a book somewhat technical called Historical Reliability of John's Gospel, Issues and Commentary, where I go through um, the text, chapter by chapter, passage by passage, raising this question. Uh, my most recent work that is on the bibliography, um, Jesus the Purifier, John's Gospel and the Fourth Quest for the Historical Jesus, came out just a year ago. Um, and if there's any chance anybody besides Peter was at my brief talk at the Bible Institute five years ago, I, I previewed what I was doing on this. There is a movement that really began with a Society of Biblical Literature seminar that's been ongoing since 2002, uh, spearheaded by Paul Anderson of George Fox University, a uh, Quaker evangelical writer um, who has spent his whole career specializing in the Gospel of John and now in, in the last 20 years has organized conferences, colloquia, uh, three meaty books have been published uh, of, of scholarly essays. Apparently, there are more uh, to come. Uh, he keeps promising them, and we keep waiting. Um, <laughs> but um, even in Johannine studies, there is a groundswell of support not to the same degree as would appropriate the synoptics, but much more so than even just 25 years ago, that would say if we use the same historical criteria that we think are the best and most reliable that we use with the synoptic gospels, a surprising number of some of the distinctives in John can be uh, validated. Obviously, he decided he wanted to do something different. And one of the arguments, it's so obvious that nobody ever thinks of it, is that we really don't have three witnesses against one. The moment you allow for even some literary dependence among Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have one witness that got copied a couple times in certain ways against one, not three independent witnesses against one. And if we wanted to try a thought experiment, almost impossible, <laughs> we're too biased, one way or the other. Imagine all you ever had knowledge of about Jesus was from two gospels, one called Mark and one called John and you had no information about whether one was more reliable than the other or older than the other, would you sense the same kind or degree of tension? I think you would sense some. I don't think you would sense nearly as much. But as soon as a couple of the evangelists decided they wanted to in part copy Mark, it skewed us 
for centuries in thinking along those lines. Just a couple of thoughts, but uh, there's more in those books. Hi. Um, I just want to ask, like, is it fair to uh, ask the questions that, let's say, Mark or Luke was more theologically focused on making a point rather than describing every detail of what historically happened. For instance, one might say uh, there were five demons and the other passage might say there was one person that was demon possessed, something like that. Were they more theologically focused on rather than spelling out every inch of the detail that happened in the story? Yeah. And that ties in with the previous gentleman's question. Once I realized that each one of the synoptics has a long, pretty long list of theological distinctives and emphases, maybe Mark the fewest, but only because he's the shortest and Matthew and Luke reused a number of them, so then he was no longer quite so distinctive. It's not that we, we hear this over and over again. John's more spiritual. John's more theological. There's a sense in which that's true. There's a sense in which we just say it because we've heard it so much. Every one of the Gospels is theological. Every one of the Gospels is spiritual. Nobody in the ancient world had ever imagined writing a history or biography if there wasn't an ideological purpose behind it. And in the religious world, we call ideology theology. <laughs> I, I wonder what some ancients would make of the things that we chronicle and preserve today just for the sake of preserving it. I won't talk about the social media per se, but oh, oh, there, I just did. Um, maybe mom likes to know what her 18-year-old daughter had for every meal the first month she's away at college, but does that really need, once it's on Facebook, it's there forever. Almost as long as the cockroaches that survived the nuclear holocaust, I mean, it, <laughs> I think I'm rambling. Um, thank you, Dr. Greg. Um, my question is, would you comment maybe a little bit on uh, recent scholarship to try and kind of like reconstruct what Jesus said and what's attributed to Jesus? Um, sort of like the quest of trying to figure out, do the Gospels tell us the very words of Jesus or do they present the tradition according to what Jesus would say or how Jesus would have said it, but not the exact same words and how that would affect maybe credibility in terms of the differences in the, in the Gospels as well. Does that affect how much reliable the authors are? Um, so I'm still struggling with accents. Um, can you boil that down to maybe a single sentence question? Oh, so I'm um, basically asking you maybe to comment a little bit in terms of um, do the Gospels present the, the words of Jesus or they present what Jesus would have said um, and then they are sort of like contextualized according to the author or according to each yeah. different gospel. Okay, thank you. Um, well, if you mean do we have the Aramaic of most of his original teachings, of course not. We have someone, maybe an oral tradition, maybe not until the final evangelist wrote, who translated into Greek. All those quotation marks in your Bibles? Ignore them. They've been added by modern committees. There were no quotation marks in any ancient Greek text, nor was there any felt need for them. 
So are they Jesus' words? Well, in one sense, no, it's the wrong language. And nobody ever claimed to be verbatim copying him. Are they believed by the original writers and readers to be faithful to what Jesus meant when he taught? Yes. Where is the threshold? This is an exercise I love to do with students. I've got about a dozen set of, of gospel parallels down from the very slightest minor deviation to places where it looks like, well, did Jesus clear the temple once or twice? And if once, who are you going to trust, John or the synoptics? And if twice, can you really believe it was so remarkably similar on each occasion? And we all go away just more befuddled than ever. And in between those two extreme ends of the spectrum, everybody has a different personal threshold. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't call that a contradiction. I don't have any problem with, well, I do. <laughs> now what does the facilitator do? Well, an educator will not try to solve every problem. <laughs> That's what, uh, oh well, I won't get into politics and talk about the kind of people to do. Um, but we have to try as best as we can. If we as modern day Christians want to say we believe in the inspiration the inerrancy, the full authority, trustworthiness of scripture, what would have counted as an error? So much of, not all, but so much of the differences among gospels come down to levels of precision. I sometimes think of the world of sport before Instant replay. Some of you are old enough to remember that. A few of you, maybe. I am. Bless you. What about before super slow motion? What about before we had 12 camera angles on anything important? Did the tip of that shoelace get a blade of green grass with a little white paint on it that signified the boundary so that we can with great confidence say our team was vindicated or they messed up for sure. In my lifetime, people never thought they would have that degree of precision and didn't expect it. Go back to an era when the sundial was the most precise timekeeping instrument and you didn't wear it on your watch or put it in your pocket. And when the gospel writer's most common transitions between passages are now about that time and in those days and now, where now is just a de in the Greek, and it means I'm linking this passage to the last one by this little word, and that's all I'm telling you. And tote, which means then, but it can mean then as in therefore, as well as then as in after this. And what if I were to read all of the synoptic gospels? Because it's John that gives me a chronology. Who knew? The spiritual gospel. Oh, maybe he is interested in more than that. Apart from John's gospel, I'd never guessed Jesus had a three-plus year ministry. Huh. What if in the synoptics, the only time I ever assume that passage A happened after, wrong way, passage B happened after passage A, is when a word that can only mean after this is used. 
curious or incurious, or said Alice in Wonderland. But let's go on to another question. Yes, thank you, um, Dr. Bloomberg. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is, um, what would you say was the process of the canonization of the Gospels? As in, why do we have four Gospels and not say the Gospel of Thomas or all those? That's a great talk. I love to give that one. How to boil it down to one minute. Um, you begin to see uh, hints of it when uh, Second Peter says things like uh, the writings of Paul, which are hard to understand and some twist to their own destruction. You begin to get second century writers, at least by the middle of the century, you begin to get them, first of all, quoting New Testament books, sometimes telling us that they're doing so, sometimes not. But then you begin to get people uh, after Tertullian suggested that um, it would make sense if the covenant with Moses led to a written authoritative document that the new covenant with Jesus would lead to a written authoritative document, hence a New Testament you begin to get people who are making lists of the books they think they would include. Here's some good news. There are seven books that from time to time were doubted. Not one of the gospels, nor Acts, nor any of the major letters of Paul is on that list. There are little ones in the back of the New Testament. And Revelation, because it was a mystery to everybody and still is. <laughs> there was no debate. There, there was so little no debate. That doesn't sound right. There was so little debate that Irenaeus in about 180 could say, well, of course there are four Gospels, just like there are four winds and four corners of the earth. Well, that's persuasive. <laughs> Not. The only way he could have gotten away making that argument was because people weren't even debating it at that point, even though Athanasius' official statement wouldn't come until the 360s, 363. Yes, it's true that it was the end of the 4th century, the 390s, the councils of Hippo and Carthage. It was the final canonization. But for all intents and purposes, it was wrapped up at the end of the 2nd century. There were just some loose ends. I mean, do we really need 2nd and 3rd John and Jude, seriously? Yeah, I think we do. Oh, so that's why we read them so much and preach from... Oh, oh. ouch, okay. I really like my sermon from 3rd John. I'm the only person I've ever heard preach from it. Um, but then I don't listen to radio preachers. If, if I'm going to turn the radio on, I want music. I can't listen to talk. That's just me. Um, I think I'm wandering again. Let's just take one more question. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Blumberg, over, over this way. Um, on your sixth point, storytelling, you reference authorized storytellers, uh, the sending of the 12, the sending of the 72, just opened a question for me. To what degree do you feel that the sending of the 72, that broader band, did that in any way play into the scriptures that we now have in front of us? And a question occurs to me from Ephesians 4.11, the foundations being laid by apostles and prophets quoted in that order. Interesting. Was it John Wenham years ago? Was, has he tried to date Luke earlier on a variety of, of uh, points? And, and then he also said uh, Luke might have been one of the 70 or 72. Um, yeah, might have been. That's a, it's always a fair, cautious way of stating things. I don't know how we would move from possibility to probability. I suspect there's more going on there than we may ever know. If only, there, there are some who have said, were the 12 a microcosm of the 70, the 12 go out again as the leaders 
So there are only, what, 60 or 62 new ones, or 58 or 60, anyway. I suspect the answer is yes to your question, and I don't know how we would ever demonstrate it. <laughs> okay, folks, um, very big uh, thank you to Dr. Blomberg for uh, sharing his expertise with us this afternoon and being willing to graciously uh, field those questions. I think Dr. Blomberg will be around for a few minutes afterwards if you'd like to connect with him. And uh, there is a book table. Um, I don't know if you'd be willing to sign, autograph a book. There you go. So if you'd like a book or a selfie with him. Uh, My wife always <laughs> reminds me that books go down in value on eBay if, if they're marked in. But um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. And there's still, sorry. Okay, good. And there's still some refreshments there, so please linger afterwards. Let's just uh, bow in a moment of prayer as we conclude events. Father, thank you for this afternoon. The opportunity we have to freely engage with this uh, topic. Thank you for Dr. Blomberg, his insights and his expertise. And um, I do pray, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen him. I know he's got a busy teaching schedule right here. And, and just pray for much grace and much blessing. Lord, we thank you for the gospel that we are saved by faith. But we thank you, Lord, as we've heard this afternoon, that it's not a blind leap of faith into the dark. And we are very grateful that um, there's a historical credibility to this message. And so once again, we just put our trust in you, affirm our praise and adoration for you. Part us now with your blessing, we pray for your name's sake. Amen.